Um, it was it was really after the first game of the season. I was actually in the stands, and um, we ended up winning. And uh, I texted Coach Miller, who is still the head coach there right now, and just said, you know, hey, what would the possibility be of me being able to come out and play football? And, uh, you know, luckily he opened me with open arms and so did all the rest of my teammates in high school. And I didn't end up getting to play until like week four or five, I believe. And then we made it to the state championship. So luckily I got 10 games to play. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was really crazy. It was a bunch of little split decisions um, that kind of led me to, to even play football in the first place. And then also being able to play that season, you know, once I did decide to want to join the team. The It Factor the most overused and undefinable phrase in sports. If you have it, everyone knows it. Clint McDuffie applying a level. The qualities that many desire, but very few possess. Dropped in the backfield by Thibodeau. But what really is it? Who has it? And how did they get it? Britton Covey gives Utah a jolt of momentum. That's what we're here to discover. We'll take the helmet off the Pac-12's elite performers to learn more about their journey towards success on Saturdays. I'm Yogi Roth, and welcome to The It Factor. Welcome back, or welcome to The It Factory, presented by Zayo. Hi, I'm your host, Yogi Roth. And you know the deal with this show. We take the helmet off of the top football players in the Pac-12 conference and dive into who they are, what their story is, what they're about, what their It Factor is. And today's story, man, am I 20 plus years around this great game? I've never heard anything like it. Our guest is Jaden Grant of Oregon State. Jaden Grant wasn't even playing high school football. And then one day while in the stands, he was watching a game and he said, yeah, I think I could play this game and I think I could play major college football. He walked down to Oregon State, became one of the top players at Oregon State, has been a captain for multiple seasons, and now he joins the show. With that, Jaden, welcome to the It Factory. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. So uh, you're an all-everything DB for this team. I I'm just curious for you. When somebody would have said to you five years ago, hey, you're going to be an all-conference member of Oregon State's defensive backfield, what do you think you would have said to them? I mean, I, I think I would have probably blindly agreed, blindly agreed with them. Um, always felt that my competitive nature um, and my work ethic would lead, lead, me, lead me to be able to achieve my goals. But, um, you know, for me at that time, it, it was really hard to see it, whether it was, you know, from the injuries or just my lack of experience or me never even dreaming, you know, growing up of being a football player at all, you know, was the reason I really couldn't see it. So I, I probably would have agreed with them because I believed in myself, but at the same time, I, I never saw this for myself. I think it's fascinating, man. Like here you were not even playing high school football necessarily, and now here you are as an all-conference player and you got a chance to continue to continue playing in your career. So, so let's go back to that moment. Like when did you decide, yeah, I want to put the pads back on and try to finish off a senior year in high school, let alone go play in college. Um, it was, it was really after the first game of the season, I was actually in the stands and, um, we ended up winning and uh, I texted coach Miller, who is still the head coach there right now. And just said, you know, Hey, what would the possibility be of me being able to come out and play football? And, uh, you know, luckily he opened me with open arms and so did all the rest of my teammates in high school. And I didn't end up getting to play until like week four or five, I believe. And then we made it to the state championship. So luckily I got 10 games to play. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was really crazy. It was a bunch of little split decisions um, that kind of led me to, to even play football in the first place. And then also being able to play that season, you know, once I did decide to want to join the team. So what were some of those split decisions you referenced? So that, that summer um, was, my last, was my junior year, summer of AAU uh, for basketball. And I was getting recruited, um, different things like that. And um, I actually rolled my ankle pretty bad. Um, was gonna actually have to get surgery. Uh, so when I came back and wanted to play football, first of all, my mom was you know, not for it at all, you know, just because she knew how hard I'd worked to you know, try to achieve my basketball dreams. And my dad was just like, man, it's your last time that you'll be able to do it. So, I mean, if you want, if you want to go do it, then, then do it. So then when I went to go join the team, you know, one of the doctors ended up telling me I might need surgery if I want to be able to play during basketball season. So it was kind of like, you know, I had to risk not being able to play, you know, basketball that season, everything I've ever worked for, or not being able to get this one last chance, you know, really for fun, to play football for fun my senior season. 
So, I mean, those were some of the little split decisions, you know, that led me to, to play football. And, you know, luckily God blessed me and, you know, I'm here now. That, that's amazing, man. I've never heard that story from you. Tell me if this summation is accurate. Like you basically chose to play versus maybe the business decision at that point in your athletic career. Yeah, I mean, at, at that point in my athletic career, um, you know, we were aiming to win our fourth state championship straight in basketball. Um, you know, I think a part of me was also frustrated with my recruiting that was going on, you know, for basketball and stuff like that. So I, I just saw, you know, how much of a team aspect there was to football. I mean, basketball too, but, you know, you're talking about hundreds of guys, a hundred guys on, on the same team, you know, all working towards a, towards a common goal. And it was just something I really wanted to be a part of. That's amazing. All right. So you've always been around people. You got a bunch of siblings. Uh, you reference your parents. What, what was your house like growing up? Uh, my house, my, my parents were, you know, really cool. Uh, they're really cool parents, but they're also um, strict in a way. Uh, you know, we were all real, real ways, um, you know, raised to treat people how we want to be treated, you know, well-mannered, different things like that. Um, but it was a very loving environment at all times. Just the love and support that, you know, my parents showed us and then, you know, that we showed to each other as siblings. Cause I have a big family as well. That's, that's another cool thing about um, growing up in the house that I grew up in. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was awesome growing up with my family. Um, you know, they're my backbone, they're my biggest support system. And, you know, I couldn't have been blessed with, with better family around me. A lot is made, of course, about your dad, Brian, playing the NBA for a long time, had a lot of success at that level. What do you remember as a kid around how you identified him? Um, I, I really just, you know, looked at him just like that. I mean, obviously we knew he played in the NBA and stuff like all the stuff that comes with that. But I mean, to, all, to us at that time, it was, it was just regular. You know, he was just that. Did he teach you little moments about being a competitor? Or do you think that you glean them just by watching him compete? He definitely, you know, taught, taught us moments about being a competitor. Um, I've told this story before, but you know, there's times where, you know, when I was younger, maybe about seven, eight years old, where, you know, I'd have a game and basketball game, I'd score a lot of points. You know, I feel like I, I did really well and I'd come in the car and, you know, wait for my dad to just give me compliments. And I remember one time he told me, you know, you're not hustling enough out there. You're not playing with enough heart out there. It was just like, you know, if you ever go out there and play, don't play with heart or, you know, don't give effort for your teammate or do whatever you have to do for your teammates again, you know, then I won't come watch you play. And then, you know, another thing he told me was that, like, if you want me to come to your games to tell you how good you are, don't ask me to come to your games either. So that was kind of the mantra that I, I took on, you know, from a young age. And it, and it really helped me be able to, you know, adapt and receive coaching as well, um, especially when I got to, you know, college playing football. I'm not really knowing anything, you know, before. How old were you when he had that discussion with you in the car? I mean, I, I had to been about probably like eight years old, nine years old. Wow. That's amazing. We got a six year old. That's our oldest right now. And uh, he just started playing organized sports. So I'll definitely take a couple cues from your, from your own man. <laughs> so how is it now? Like when you get in the car after a game, do you, do you still like seek him to say, something to you? And if so, do you want the criticism or do you want, hey, hey, nice job, man? Yeah. I mean, I think now it's a little bit different um, with football because, you know, he, he never played football. So it's funny because I always, you know, tell my, my friends and stuff. Um, he actually tries to give me more like tips about like the X's and O's in football more than he did in basketball. And so when he <laughs> starts going off about a certain player or whatever, I'll just be like, yeah, okay. You know, but obviously, you know, he gives me, you know, great pointers on, you know, how to you know, train and, and be and carry yourself like a professional as well. Yeah, you've always done that. Ever since the first time that I spoke with you, you carried yourself with, you know, an air of professionalism and humility. When you think of people that have great success, like you've seen some, you've lived with one. Are there a couple traits that are consistent? Um, I think that you touched, you know, I think you hit the, the hammer on the nail um, with humility. And um, it wasn't something that I had to look to for, you know, great athletes or, um, you know, inspirational figures. And it was right there in my household with my, with my parents, you know, two of the most humble people that I know. I'm um, extremely down to earth, extremely giving, you know, extremely loving. Um, they don't judge, you know, people. And uh, they're just all around good people. So it wasn't really like I had to look for, 
or anything like that. It's, it's just how we were because that's all we were around, you know. So, yeah, I'm extremely thankful for that. It's interesting. Like, I'm flashing back to, like, I've called a lot of your games. I've probably called 10, 15 games in your career. And your dad always gets mentioned. Your mom doesn't get a lot of play over the airwaves. How has she impacted you the most to become the man you are today? Um, I mean, just by helping raise me as a, as a man, first of all. Um, and another, another thing that I think, you know, there's always some misconception or, or assumption is that uh, people always think that I, you know, you get, he must get his competitive nature from his, you know, from his dad, you know, because my dad played and all that stuff. But really it's from my mom, um, you know, my competitive nature, my, my work ethic. Obviously my dad showed me a lot of those things. But I mean, it, it's it's really from my mom. My mom will compete at anything. She doesn't want to lose. You know, never wants to lose. Um, she's stubborn in that way. She's stubborn as a competitor. And then, um, you know, her work ethic is second to none. I mean, and still to this day, I don't know if you're familiar with the company Zumba, but um, you know, she was one of the original, you know, Zumba dancers. You know, kind of kind of created in a way back, you know, way back in the early 2000s. And uh, she's still doing it today. She goes all over the globe. You know, sometimes I would only see her, you know, a few times, you know, per month because she would be traveling so much working, you know, all across the globe. So, I mean, that's that's one of the most hardworking people I know. And I'm, I'm forever thankful for, you know, all the lessons that my mom instilled for me and all that I've learned from her just by watching her. All right. So what kind of music was playing in your house when you were growing up? <laughs> Uh, my, my family is really like into a, a diverse, you know, diverse set of music, uh, especially my dad. Um, obviously now I'll, I'll listen to hip hop and, and rap and stuff like that. But, you know, when I'm on my own, I like a lot of R&B, um, you know, R&B and soul. Uh, my dad listens to a bunch of, you know, older stuff too. Like he, he always showed us like Queen, um, uh, uh, Pink Floyd, um, you know, different type of different type of music like that. So we're kind of all over the place with music. That's, that's great, man. Diversity in music. You can play a bunch of positions on the football field. I, I see the correlation there. Coming up on the It Factory. My, I called my dad the night before and he told me, don't worry about, you know, what you can't control. Only focus on, you know, what you can't control. And the worst thing that you ever could do is cry or whine or complain about not getting an opportunity and then not be ready when you get that opportunity. I read a quote that your dad told you where he said, when you see a window of opportunity, don't just take it, run through it. I wanna go back to that week one game when you're at a high school stadium and watching a high school football team play. And you're not obviously on the team. You reference, you went on the team, you played 10 games, you go and team takes a nice run. Uh, but what about that opportunity for you? Were you like, I'm gonna go run through this and continue playing college football versus college hoops? Um, I think it was just uh, the potential that I, that I saw in myself. I mean, you know, I always aspired to be, you know, an NBA player growing up, but then you realize that, okay, like I play football for maybe a few weeks and, you know, I have these schools that, you know, I might have dreamed about, you know, for recruiting me for basketball, but now they're recruiting me for football, you know, something that was kind of brand new to me. So I think the idea of, um, you know, being able to ultimately achieve my dreams of playing playing a sport at the highest level. I thought that was more realistic with football. And um, like you said, I saw a window of opportunity. I mean, even even the window of opportunity I saw um, in my choice to, you know, flip from Oregon to walk on to Oregon State. Um, that was, you know, one of the biggest, biggest decisions and, you know, best decisions that I've ever made in my life. So I would say there's a there's a bunch of different little examples, you know, within my journey that um, I kind of had that mindset on. I'm a fellow former walk-on as well. Uh, curious how, how you would describe your walk-on experience. Um, my walk-on experience, um, at first it was pretty much, it, it, actually, it was actually different than I, than I expected. You know, I, I had this, my, my pops, you know, when I, when I first wanted to walk on to Oregon and Oregon State, um, he didn't really know how it worked for 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 football. He only knew how it worked, you know, kind of for basketball. And back in his day, only thing he knew of it was that, you know, he didn't really know any walk-ons that were on his team that ever got an opportunity to play. So I didn't really know anything, what to expect going in. I just knew that the only thing I could do was control what I could control. And that's, you know, how much work that I put in on my game. 
um, you know, how receptive I am as a learner and, uh, you know, how good of a teammate I could be as well as a student. I remember when, uh, when I walked on, I walked into the facility, I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I walk into Pitt and I, I'm looking in the lockers to see my last name and I don't see Roth anywhere. I go to the 80s, nothing. I was a receiver. I'm like, oh, maybe they put me in the single digits, nothing. I go to the 20s, I go to the 30s, go to the 40s, nothing. So I go for the equipment manager and his name was Ox. And I feel like every equipment manager has like a cool nickname, right? And I said, hey, Ox, uh, I can't find my locker. And he goes, what's your name? I had no <laughs> clue who I was. And I said, uh, my name's Yogi Roth. And he goes, oh, let me look. And he goes through this piece of paper, first page, second page, third page, gets to the back page. He goes, oh yeah, Roth, uh, locker 106. And I sat there as I walked like deep into the dark corner and the doldrums of the locker room. And I was like, I've watched football for whatever, 15 years or something at the time. I'm like, I've never seen anybody wear a jersey 106. <laughs> and my shoulder pads were too big. I had a D lineman face mask. Uh, my hip pads were massive. Shoes were two sizes too big. But I remember that day, Jaden, uh, looking at myself in the proverbial mirror saying, okay. I'm going to be in a relentless pursuit of a competitive edge yeah. right now. Uh, that moment for me was like a catalytic one as a walk on. D did you have one? Because you haven't just become a starter or a scholarship player. Like you've become one of the better players in the last 10 years for Oregon State defensively. Yeah. I, I mean, I really just accredit everything, you know, to my competitive nature. Um, you know, when I first got here, I think that something actually might have helped me. Um, was my lack of experience because it made it a lot easier for me to just be a sponge and learn from you know everyone around me whether that was you know my my corner coach coach Hall at the time my teammates um, maybe even like a linebacker coach or anything so really just soaking in all the information you know that I could and, and just trying to literally do exactly what my coach told me to do and then obviously as a walk on you know I remember first getting there for summer and. <laughs> It was a workout and it was called the Strongman Challenge. And, you know, it was a bunch of different things that were just, you know, brutal, you know, heavy, heavy lifting workouts, you know, outside. And one of them was like a 500 pound sled push. And everybody had to do the same way. Everybody had to do the same workout, linemen, DBs, it didn't matter. And um, I couldn't push this 500 pound sled. And I'm sitting there trying to push it so hard. You know, I'm holding my breath that, you know, I almost pass out and I couldn't even finish the workout. And I remember, you know, having the, the trainers have to, you know, help me off the field and, and stuff like that and being embarrassed and, you know, looking, seeing everybody looking at me and, you know, kind of, you kind of know how they look at you, you know, after that, you know, when they doubt you and they're overlooking you. And so I, I remember that first fall camp, um, that very first fall camp, I didn't have a single, like, it, they wrote like ones, twos, threes, fours. And I didn't have a single rep on the depth chart. I was like underneath. So I didn't have a, a slot on the depth chart. And uh, for very first team period of my very first practice at fall camp, they ended up giving me like the last rep of um, like the fourth string or third string. And the very first play I had a pick. And then from there, it was just like, it kind of accelerated from there. I, I kind of gained a, a new confidence in myself and believed like I can do this. You know, I'm not gonna worry. Cause my, I called my dad the night before and he told me, don't worry about, you know, what you can't control. Only focus on, you know, what you can't control. And the worst thing that you ever could do is cry or whine or, complaining about not getting an opportunity and then not be ready when you get that opportunity. So that was kind of my mantra. I wasn't gonna focus on you know anything I couldn't control. I was just gonna put as much into it as I could and um, just control what I could control. I love that. I, I've always felt as a walk on, I remember this as well, similar scenario, right? Like you're buried on the depth chart, somebody's shoe falls off, you got a chance, you run right in. And I can remember, and I tell this to walk-ons when I talk to them coming out of high school now, if someone's thinking about it, of rep, you just got to get one rep and then see if you can compete to get two and then three and then maybe a series. And if you just take that rep for what it is, like the greatest rep in the history of your football life in that five-second window, you'll gain another one. And I, I, I love that you said that, man. Yeah. And I, that, that, it was all about, you know, proving, proving myself, you know what I mean? Like I knew I, I didn't feel entitled to anything. You know, I, I didn't, you know, for a slim, I, for a slim moment, I felt entitled to, you know, having at least a rep that first day of fall camp. But, you know, after I called my dad, he kind of got my head straight and I went out there and, you know, had to pick that first play and then saw that, you know, the, the more you do, you know, the more you'll get. 
So I was just, you know, super straight focused on, you know, just, just controlling what I can control not to be repetitive, but, you know, yeah. And eventually believing that it, it will be rewarded and you know, that my hard work would be rewarded. What do you think is more challenging, earning a scholarship in high school or earning a scholarship in college? Uh, I would say earning a, a scholarship in college because I actually had a scholarship to um, Portland State for football that I didn't take. And I didn't, even at that time, I didn't understand why I'm like, kind of confused why Portland State well offered me for football. I, I didn't know if I was good or not. You know, I just know I played for a good team, you know, with some good players and great coaches. Um, but I guess, I guess I never really knew how much it would take, you know, to, to earn a scholarship, you know, here at Oregon State. Just because it's it's not all it's it's not as simple as you know a lot of people think. There's a I didn't know about a count of scholarships or you know a certain amount of scholarships you can have here, and you have to factor in people are coming back and different things like that. So um, I, I would say college. Still to come on the It Factory. Game of horse. You Peyton Pritchard. Who wins right now? <laughs> P probably wins. Nah nah. P P definitely got me in a game of horse. I mean, if we're playing like dunk ball, though, or something like that, I get them. I want to bring it back um, to when you're nine years old. Um, that's, you know, a year after your dad sat in the car with you and said, hey, if you don't hustle, I'm not going to come to your games. Uh, but a year after that, he told you that he had Parkinson's disease. What is that like if you took us back to wherever you were? in that moment um it was just like I, I don't remember having like a really like you know reaction or anything like that and i think a large part of that was that i didn't know exactly what parkinson's was so my siblings and i it wasn't something that we you know talked about a bunch i mean my parents at the time didn't really have all the information you know at that time to provide for us nonetheless to you know nine and ten year old kids um who obviously were concerned for our father's well-being. So um, it was just the time that we were kind of like in the darkness a little bit, just because we didn't know what came next. Um, you know, the only thing, only example that we knew was he was like Michael J. Fox, you know, Back to the Future, we love that movie. He has it and, and Muhammad Ali has it as well. The two, you know, those were the two other figures that we knew who had Parkinson's. So um, it was definitely a time where uh, we leaned on each other a lot um, and um, because, you know, you're, you're young, you're kids, you go to school and you hear rumors and this, this, that. I can remember, you know, kids coming up to me saying stupid things just because it was, you know, my dad was who he was. And, you know, when he got Parkinson's, it was in the news and wherever it was at. So it, it was a time where our family really stuck together um, and we didn't really know exactly what was next. Yeah, I read uh, some articles where you talked about that of classmates coming up to you or teachers talking about it. When you were walking home or if you were by yourself on the basketball court, like what were you saying to yourself to, to process that news? Um, I mean, I, I feel like I, I just was, you know, trusting in what my parents were saying. And, you know, they were saying everything was going to be all right. And I think it was honestly the way that my dad took it. Um, you know, he could have felt, you know, extremely sorry for himself. And, um, you know, said, why me and, and question everything and why he got it. But he didn't do that. Um, instead, you know, he launched the Brian Grant Foundation, which is, you know, different than any foundation out there um, for Parkinson's because it's a foundation that helps people, you know, live a happy and healthy, you know, life every single day, you know, with Parkinson's, you know, rather than waiting for a cure or waiting for something that will, you know, slow down, you know, your, your um, progression in Parkinson's. So, um, you know, I'm extremely proud of my father for um, how he's handled that. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, you know, him and, you know, the Brian Ground Foundation um, continues to this day to um, help people, you know, live a happy and healthy lifestyle, you know, with Parkinson's. And how's your dad doing now? He's doing great, man. He's doing great. Um, he's been active. Uh, he comes to every Beaver game. Like He's one of those fans, he thinks he knows it all. <laughs> But man, my dad's doing really great. That's great, man. It's beautiful to hear. I know all the listeners will enjoy that as well. Um, I brought up like what you say to yourself because you come off to me as a very introspective young man. And there's a theory out there uh, that's been proven that is titled play therapy. 
right? Which is like when you go through things, you can play your way through them. So as a kid, I'm sure the first time you maybe got dumped by a girlfriend or something, you shot hoops for hours. Or if you got in a fight with your sister or somebody like you played a sport for hours, you've gone through a lot in your lifetime, as you just referenced in your personal life, but your football life has been gnarly too. Yeah, Like you've seen a run, but within that run, there's been some dark times at Oregon State. Like have you utilized like play therapy at all? If you, if you look at it as how I just defined it or what has been your self-talk like over the course of Oregon State's rise from you know, struggling defensively to now, this is one of the better units in the country overall. Um, honestly, um, praying to God would be the one for me. Um, just trusting faith in the Lord that, that everything will be okay. And I'm um, leaning on him, you know, through all the hard times. Um, I'd have to say that's, that's really what got me by. Um, another thing that also, you know, would get me by those kind of low moments was always self-reflection. Um, looking at whatever you think happened, um, why it happened, whatever it may be, and um, just really thinking like, okay, what could I, what could I have done differently, you know, to get the outcome that I wanted? And um, I think that's been my biggest thing, and that's you know really the, and it's a hard thing to do, you know, hold yourself accountable. It, it is a hard, <clears throat> it is a hard thing to do, but you know you can never lie to yourself, you can never lie to the man in the mirror, you know what I'm saying? And um, self reflections in all aspects of life, whether it's football, school, whatever it may be, um, was one of the things that I have to, you know, credit for um, the amount of growth that I've had as a man, you know, as a football player, and, you know, just as a person in general. Yeah, that, that's and that's surprising, right? When we look in the mirror, we recognize the truth, and we also sometimes look in the mirror and recognize the truth, and and recognize ourselves as being a vehicle to help lead. You, you are that. You went from the walk-on who couldn't push the 500-pound sled, who was being judged by the veterans on the team, to now setting the bar for veterans on the team. But what I love about you, Jaden, is that you've done it in, in other areas. And I want to ask you about it. And let's talk about social justice first. You have taken a stance that is incredible, right? I'm, I'd imagine you're proud of it. Anybody who knows you uh, will get behind you and what you stand for. But, but I'm wondering, what was it like when you looked in the mirror and saw that man, which is you, and said, you know what, all right, I'm, I'm going to utilize my voice now and not just be the, the quiet leader by example? Yeah, um, I think for me, it was, um, you know, like that self-reflection, like, like you just said, um, you know, realizing that, you know, I, I went to high school in, you know, a very suburban community that was majority white. And uh, feeling like I was kind of in a bubble at that time. And, you know, I knew about all the things that were going on and I, I felt emotions about them, but I can't remember ever really being very vocal about them, you know, back then as a high schooler or a middle schooler or whatever I was. And so, um, you know, after George Floyd died and obviously, you know, the news and, and the press and, you know, all the attention that that tragedy had gotten, um, you know, the movement, I feel like was at an all time high. and. Um, like I said, I had to look in the mirror and, you know, and say, you know, I, I don't care what anybody's going to say, you know, about what I have to say, because at the end of the day, I'm fighting for equality and I'm fighting for love. Yeah. So what has your family said? What has mom said about the fight for equality and love and watching her baby grow up to now be the man that you are? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're always, you know, telling me how proud they are of me, you know, for using my voice and using my platform, you know, and, and how important it is, you know, for me to use my platform because, you know, there's so many people that look just like us, you know, who have these same feelings and these same emotions, you know, and aren't saying these same words, but they may not have the same exact platform, you know, to reach the audience that they need to reach to, you know, to, to contribute to their part in their fight for equality and their fight for social justice. So um, that was the biggest thing for me as far as pointers from my parents. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm just overall blessed to, to have the guidance for them in, in all aspects of my life. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are, too, because now you've become such a vocal member of sports society. You did it with NIL as well. Like, you know, again, I just kind of chuckle, right? Like you're in the stands, whatever, six years ago watching a game. Then you're getting rolled by a sled. And now you're a captain multiple years. And now you're talking to like the governing body around NIL. This journey's gnarly for you, bro. Like, 
when you think of the your voice and the meetings you're in now, especially specifically on NIL and like the governing body in Oregon, like did you have a pinch me moment or are you just like, yeah, all right, this is where I'm supposed to be right now? Um, the NIL thing, um, that, that was a really cool experience um, working with Senator Courtney, um, you know, on the bill. I remember when I first reached out to him, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, he's not maybe he's not going to want to be bothered or, you know, there's bigger fish to fry than this. But, um, you know, he invited me for a meeting on Zoom and Ramoki Huma actually helped me as well. It was been a big help and especially for the We Are United movement. And um, basically he just asked me what you know i felt about the bill and where i thought it could improve and different things and you know eventually five months later six months later after you know meeting at least a few times a week with him and um his uh, legislative council derek sangston um ended up creating what was you know passed and in effect now sb5 so that was an amazing experience even getting to testify you know in the senate and um in the house as well um, it was a really cool experience all right, so what's more nerve wracking, like being in a room like that on a stage like that or game on the line and you're in man coverage against a wow. being, receiver? Being, um, being in a room like that, it was definitely more nerve wracking, more nerve wracking for me. Um, but um, I was glad to always get, you know, good feedback. And um, actually had, you know, some other senators, Senator Manny um, reached out to me as well. And we had a conversation and, you know, he told me he appreciated my efforts as well. So, you know, that made me feel a lot better about it. It's, it's really cool, man. Like you made a decision because you believe that you could play at the highest level of college football. And college football has opened up these doors for you that some of us didn't even know existed a couple of years ago. When you think and reflect back on your career now, uh, what, what part of it do you think gives you and brings you the most joy? I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you. Um... I talk to my family about it all the time. Like, I'm so thankful for God, you know, leading me to Oregon State. And I'm so thankful for everything, you know, that I went through here because everything that I went through led me to exactly where I am right now, you know, which, I mean, even talking to you, <laughs> like, I remember thinking when I was younger, I remember seeing you come, you know, cover our, one of our fall scrimmages when I was younger. You know what I'm saying? I remember guys going to media day and I thought I would never, you know, that would oh, be cool to go to media day one day, but I, I never really saw it happening. So everything, you know, happened for a reason. And um, I just kept my faith in God and, you know, kept working hard and, um, and constantly trying to improve in all aspects of my life. And man, I'm just blessed. All right, so within that, the show is titled The It Factor. Like, how, how would you define your It Factor? What makes you unique? Well, I say my It Factor is just my my competitiveness. Um, I mean, I feel like I, I would do anything, you know, for my team to win. I mean, I'm far from perfect. You know, I'm far from the most talented or best player. But um, I think if you ask my teammates, you know, they, they know, you know I would do whatever it takes, you know, to help them win, win a game. Um, I've been through numerous amount of injuries. You know, if you tell me, hey, you got to go, you know, make this play for your teammates, but you're going to get hurt. You're going to be done for the season, but you'll win the game. You know, I'll do it 10 times out of 10 because, you know, my teammates, you know, in this program, it means that much to me. Um, so I, I guess that would be my factor. Yeah, I've always felt that the factor can be defined by when someone walks into the room, they feel your presence. And then you make everybody around you better. And I got to imagine if I pulled your teammates, they'd all say that you have made them better, man. Yeah, I, I would hope so. Yeah, I would hope so too. All right, last couple before we get you out of here. Um, how heavy is the chainsaw? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's probably like 10, maybe 10 pounds, 15 pounds, maybe lighter. I don't, I don't, I don't know. All right, what's it feel like when you rev that thing after a turnover? Well, at first it was kind of like nerve wracking because I didn't understand. Like, I'm like, I know it doesn't have the blades, but can I still cut somebody? So I don't, I don't want to be up here reckless with the chainsaw or anything like that. Um, you know, but after that, it's kind of become this thing, you know, like the chainsaw. You see fans come with cutouts of the chainsaw. You know, everybody wants to see the chainsaw. So especially when we play at home, um, you know, being able to rev up that chainsaw, you know, get the fans fired up. But, I mean, even an even better feeling is, you know, revving up that chainsaw when we're away. 
and seeing everybody's faces because, you know, they know what it is and, you know, they probably think it's annoying or whatever. So, I mean, I'm glad that, you know, whoever came up with that prop, that was a genius idea. <laughs> yeah, we love it, man. I can remember when I was coaching at SC, we would lose at Oregon State and they didn't have the chainsaw to hold yet, but they would rev it on the big screen. You probably remember as a kid going to those games and it looks so cool. And now it's, it's even cooler. Um, all right, next one. Game of horse. You, Peyton Pritchard, who wins right now? P probably wins. Nah, nah. P, P definitely got me in a game of horse. I mean, if we're playing like dunk ball though, or something like that, I get them. All right. All right. Was was there a little bit of FOMO last year when you watched Oregon State take a run in March Madness for you? A FOMO? Yeah. Like being not being able to go. Yeah. Like, did you wish that you were on the team? Like, oh man. Oh I was oh this oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, like you dream about stuff like that, you know, as a basketball player, aspiring college basketball player growing up, you know, you always see March Madness and you always remember all the signature moments throughout the years. So it was a little bit of FOMO, but I mean, at this point in my, this point in my career, um, I think I can say I've, I've officially put the hoop shoes down and, um, you know, just, just sticking with the football. <laughs> uh, where do you think confidence comes from? Uh, I think confidence comes from preparation. Um, you know, being able to have confidence, you know, in yourself because you've seen it before and you know that, you know, you've put all the right things into, into this moment to just simply give yourself a chance at success. So um, for me personally, I would say my confidence always comes from preparation. Cool. And then finish the sentence for me. It all comes down to... Who wants it more? Well said from a former walk-on. Seems like you've wanted it more majority of your life, man. Thank you. I love it. All right, that is Jaden Grant, all everything defensive back, nickel defender. He's done a little bit of everything for Oregon State. Thank you, my man, for coming on the Itch Factory. Thank you, Yogi, for having me. You got it. All right, you know the deal. You want conversations with the top players in this league that are dominating Pac-12 football, will play on Sundays and have incredible stories. There's no other place. It's the Itch Factory. We got you covered. From A to Z, all the top performers, we take the helmet off and dive into what makes them tick and their origin story. Jaden Grant, absolutely no different. Make sure you check us out if you want to watch the video of this. Jaden and I, it'll be on Pac-12 Insider, pack-12.com slash insider. If you want the podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, just pump in the It Factory, Yogi Roth, and we got you covered. So on behalf of our crew, Oregon State and Jaden in this episode and our producer, TJ Brassel, thank you and stay safe. Peace.